everybody. My name is Sanshi Mahar, and this summer I worked with Dr. Glenna Bett at the Department of Gynecology, Department of Physiology and Biophysics. Today is July 13th, and my project is based on the role of proline hinge in the inactivation of KB14 channel. I'll explain what it is later. Today, today I will define uh, my topic, and I will, um, as I said earlier, I will. I'll tell you what is KB14 channel and what is the proline hinge and the two types of inactivation of the KB14 channel, the anti and the C type, and why we are studying this and the method where we injected RNA into O sites, which is frog egg cells, and we studied it using two electro voltage clamping and the results, which is the um, which is graph subcurrent that we got from our channel. And conclusion, um, that we've drawn from um, current of different variation of the channel. And my reference and acknowledgement. First off, the, I'll start with some terminology. Ion channels are glycoproteins, and they're selective, meaning only certain ion channel would allow certain, cha certain ions to um, into and out of the cell. For example, potassium channel would only allow potassium channel in and out of the cell. And there are also um, gated, meaning their opening and closing uh, depends on the stimulus. The stimulus can be a change in membrane potential, which is also known as voltage gated. Um, activate, um, a channel is said to be activated when the channel is open and said to be closed, um, I mean said to be inactivated when it's closed. Um, potassium, potassium channels are one type of channel in your body. They're important regarding cardiac um, cardiac um, electrical activity in your heart and um, KB14 is one type of potassium channel. It's um, thought to be respons responsible for um, slow recovery of potassium channel during heart failure. Um, it's, also, it's also known to be responsible for a condition called cardiac arrhythmia which is irregular heart beating. This is an actual structure of what the KB14 channel looks like. Um, it's known for its rapid inactivation. Um, there's two types of inactivation, the N type and the C type. The, this structure right here represents the two um, inactivation. The N type is the fast inactivation, and it's in the intracellular side of the pore, which is the side that's facing the cytoplasm of the cell. And the C type is the slow type inactivation. It's in the both. It's in both of the sides. The, the side that's facing the environment and the side that's facing the inside of the cell. This is a simplified version of the of the KB14 channel. Um, this is the N terminal. The N type inactivation depends on the N terminal, and this is the amino acid sequence of. I mean, as a sequence of KB14 channel. This part right here, prol proline, valine, and proline, represents the actual proline hinge, what we are studying. The proline hinge is the part right here. The C type inactivation depends on the proline hinge. For, this, for the purpose of this presentation, we'll mostly be focusing on the C type and the C type inactivation and proline hinge. For those of you who are having a hard time imagining what a proline hinge is, it is like a hinge on a door. It's flexible like the hinge, and it allows the pore to open and close. In the past, in the past any mutation in this proline and valine section proved to have inhibited um, C-type inactivation, and this is the effect we're trying to uh, replicate. The purpose of this experiment is to further study the kinetics of KB14 channel and to determine the role the proline hinge had on the, on the gating of the channel. And we deleted the end terminal, end terminal of, um, of our channel to isolate the, C, isolate the C type inactivation since that's what we are studying. And we mutated, we mutated the second proline in the glycine to second proline to glycine to see the effect the mutation has on the channel. We took the part of the gene that codes for that codes for the 
for the channel, which is KCNA4, um, and we transcribed it to CRNA, which, it tra which we injected into Xenopus oocyte, which is a frog egg cell, which we kept overnight, and that during that period of time, the RNA is translated to our actual channel, which we've studied. Xenopus oocytes are, as I mentioned earlier, are frog egg cells. They're removed surgically under trichin anesthesia, and they look like, they come in clumps called ovarian lobes, um, which includes connective tissue, um, blood vessels, and oocytes. And what we did was we separated them, and they look like this when they're separated, before we injected. Oocytes are surrounded by a membrane called vitellin membrane, which does not express iron cello, and they're, they're surrounded by another, another layer called the follicular layer, which does express the iron, which does express its own iron channel. So this has to be removed before we can actually inject our own RNA and express a channel. So it's removed using a series of treatment of collagenase, which is an enzyme that digests the follicular layer. After the follicular layer has been removed, we inject RNA into RNA into the oocytes at a concentration of 0.005 to 0.1 micromolar, and we incubate it in 18 degrees Celsius for 24 to 48 hours. During that period, the, um, the RNA is translated to our channel. After, after 24 hours, we usually study them using two voltage patch clamping where two electrodes are injected into the oocytes and that measures the uh, current of iron going in and out of the cell. This gives us an idea of activation and inactivation of the cell or the channel. In my results, I'll be discussing graph of the wild type, which is the type without any mutation and the graph where our N-terminal is deleted and our C-type is isolated. And, the mut and our mutation um, to glycine in the polling hinge. And the combined effect of the N-terminal and, and mutation to polling hinge. This is, the, this, is, um, this is the structure of the wild type. This box right here is a standard protocol that we, that we follow whenever we are um, studying current. Um, this is our holding potential. This is the this is the voltage that we set our channel our channel in, and this P1 is what we what shows us inactivation. The reason you see so many linings is because we increase um, voltage in increments of 10 millivoltage over time. The P2 is the is the recovery. Um, this is what we are looking at. It's the scale is current by time. Over here is our holding potential. And when the channel is activated, the graph increases. And when the channel is inactivated, the graph rapidly decreases. This rapid um, inactivation of wild type is due to the N type. This is where we deleted our N type. Since we deleted our N type, the inactivation has slowed down. And this is, this is, again, the structure of our wild type. But this graph is different from the ones we've seen before. Is this is because this has a the second proline in the hinge is mutated to a glycine. The mutation has changed the flexibility of the, of the proline hinge, causing, the, causing um, inactivation to slow down. Finally, we combined our N-terminal deletion and our mutation together. And what we observe that although the channel is activated at the same rate, the inactivation has slowed down dramatically, meaning the channel is open for a longer time than it should be, causing, ca causing cardiac arrhythmia, which is irregular heartbeat. From this graph, we have concluded that deletion of N-terminal and mutation to glycine slows down inactivation, and flexibility of the proline hinge is important for the C-type inactivation. My, I will be continuing with this study, and my next step would be to quantify the graphs and find a constant rate of inactivation and to, and to determine different um, physiological conditions such as pH has on the N-type and C-type inactivation. 
My final step would be to find a blocker to block the mutation and prevent um, inhibition of C-type inactivation. This would, um, this, would, um, this, would allow, this would allow us to possibly prevent cardiac arrhythmia, which is usually caused after a heart failure. This is my reference. I want to thank Dr. Bat, my mentor, Dr. Rasmussen, Sally, Lian, Gloria, Jennifer, Agnes, and Judy, which are the secretaries and uh, PhD students and lab technicians, and C-Step, um, Ms. Shana, Cramp Owens, Dr. Falaran, Matthew, Tuana, Christopher, and C-Step interns. injection of um, the oocytes, I actually tried doing it and I broke the needle a couple of times because they're so tiny and um, they're really hard to work with. And then um, you have to find the right, um, the right gene for the, the right gene for the channel, which is, which, which is a long process. And then you have to, you have to like um, inject it into the plasmid of uh, bacteria and the, these things can take a long time. The timing is an issue, and plus, um, electro, you have to know a lot about electrophysiology. This is not just biology. And electrophysiology is a hard field if it's not your field. So I had a lot of, a lot of, time, a lot of hard time just understanding the graph. So you mentioned before that there were certain things that you had to do in the mornings. How important is timing to what you're doing, and how much time do you need to elapse? Well, um, when you're doing collagenous treatment, you have to do, um, you have to give it a, like um, an hour. You have to come back in an hour or two hours, and then change um, change the collagenous over and over again. Because if you keep it for a long time, it's over digested, and your your egg cells are ruined. You have to start all over again. And um, when you're when you're also doing um, overnight, when you're when you're um, incubating your oocytes, you have to come and change it every morning, or else. Um, they break down. 